YouTube is shaking up music streaming. Android Wear can work without a phone, and we'll find out if signing your name makes you more honest. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 466 for Thursday, November 12th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome, I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get to the tech news. Microsoft's Windows 10 had its first major update today with new features for consumers and enterprise customers. The improvements include better context menus, Skype integration across dedicated messaging apps, and Skype video apps, and some tweaks to the Edge browser and Cortana. In other Microsoft news, the company reissued a wonky security update for Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 that they released on Patch Tuesday this week. The Knowledge Base article didn't say what the issues were, but apparently the update was not playing well with Outlook, and this should fix it. YouTube launched a new music app today, including a paid subscription option, but this is not as straightforward as it first sounds classic Google. The YouTube Music app is free on iOS and Android and contains the same sort of ad-supported videos you can now get on YouTube, the site or the app. However, if you subscribe to YouTube Red, YouTube's new subscription service for music and all the rest of the videos out there, you also get access to the YouTube Music subscription. If you are already subscribed to Google Play Music, you will also get the YouTube Music subscription for free. And if all of this confuses you, you are not alone. YouTube Music is like YouTube, but just for music, and it's free. But you can subscribe for $9.99 a month or $12.99 per month if you purchase through the iOS app. Also, if you have already subscribed to Google Play Music, you're automatically subscribed to YouTube Music. The subscription version of YouTube Music strips out the ads, allows you to listen offline, and lets you choose between audio and video versions of the music. Also, YouTube Music is only available in the U.S. for now. The newest Android watches will now go online. No smartphone needed. Android Wear supports Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but now you'll be able to take calls, send and receive SMS, get search results and more without pairing with a phone. According to the official Android blog, the first Android Wear watch with cellular support is the LG Watch Urbane 2nd Edition LTE. Facebook might soon make it harder for you to destroy your life with an unfortunate photograph. BuzzFeed News says Facebook is testing a Snapchat-like feature that will make photos disappear one hour after they're sent. Like so many of Facebook's new features, they're announced long before most of us have access to them, so keep thinking twice before you share those questionable photos for now. And speaking of the increase in ephemeral communication, Dumb Cuneiform is the name of the company that will says it will take your perfect tweet, perfect text, or Facebook post, or Snapchat message, and they will emblazon it on a stone tablet in the ancient writing system of Mesopotamia known as Cuneiform, because nobody said our internet communications had to be fleeting. Now, this might be fake, although in their FAQ, they say it's not fake. I was too cheap to check it out for myself, which is saying a lot because it only costs $20. Coming up, a University of Virginia researcher explains why e-signatures might be turning us all into liars. But first, this episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. You need to know how to cook. Not only will you feel like you know your way around the kitchen, but cooking at home means eating healthier and saving money instead of ordering expensive takeout again. But where do you start? Blue Apron has you covered. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron delivers all the fresh ingredients you need to create home-cooked meals. Just follow the easy step-by-step instructions. Each meal can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. No overwhelming trips to the grocery store and no more sad takeout. So no matter your dietary preferences, Blue Apron makes it a breeze to discover and prepare dishes like Thai chicken meatball curry with lemongrass and jasmine rice, or Trattoria-style cheeseburgers with crispy rosemary garlic potatoes and aioli right in your own kitchen. Cook with ingredients you've never used before, such as watermelon radishes, farro, and purple potatoes. Recipes are between 500 and 700 calories per portion. Delicious and good for you. Right now, you can get your first two meals free just by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. 
with Apple Pay, Android Pay, Samsung Pay, PayPal, and so many of us just paying with credit cards online, I sometimes feel like a caveman when I'm asked to sign my name when I'm paying for a credit card and paying by a credit card in a store. And like so many of us, I just scribble something and so I could get out of there. The e-signatures we use when emailing documents seem even easier. You just click the box to say you mean whatever you've just said or written. But our guest today is an assistant professor at the University of Virginia. She's just published her research on why electronic signatures might change the way people feel about what they're signing. Eileen Chow is the assistant professor of public policy and social psychology at UVA. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you so much for having me, Megan. So tell us why you decided to study e-signatures. It actually started in the, in the classroom. I started to notice that when students handwrite their notes versus when they type it on a laptop, they actually give uh, different learning results. And I made that observation right around tax season when I was asked to file my tax taxes online using a PIN number. And so I started to associate how perhaps these different sorts of electronic signatures may have an impact on subsequent behavior. And that's when I started looking at this line of research. So which types of e-signatures did you study? Um, I studied the more common types of electronic signatures. Uh, as you mentioned, people can check a box and that acts as their electronic signature. Um, and I studied three different types of PIN numbers, the randomly generated PIN that we often receive from our uh, banks or IRS, um, or something that's uh, more familiar, a PIN number that's more familiar to us, or a self-generated PIN. I also study uh, electronic signatures such as when you're asked to type your full name, um, which would then act as your electronic signature. So, uh, you know, I get so frustrated with signatures. I just, you know, sometimes I write Santa Claus, sometimes I write an X. I try to entertain my children by whatever I'm scribbling on there. Uh, <laughs> but when I start to read your research, uh, it was really interesting. So, you know, why uh, are why do you think real signatures are important still? So this research highlights the difference um, between objective function and symbolic weight. So uh, electronic signatures behave in the same way as drawing a Santa Claus or actually giving the signature that you have that you've been practicing practicing since you were five. That, however, has very different psychological meanings to the signer. And so through this research, what I find is when you're asked to provide your signature to acknowledge um, that you to acknowledge the commitment that you're making to uh, your tax return or to the fact that you're actually signing your credit card receipt, that means different to us psychologically. So you had test, test subjects uh, solve puzzles, they had to complete other, other tasks, and then sign yeah. their names to prove that they'd provided accurate information or use an electronic signature. Uh, some of the people had to provide the traditional signatures, others had e-signatures. Uh, what did you find? Right. So um, in this research, I looked at the act of signing. Right. So you can sign either using a pen or you can sign either using using your stylus. And so it's not about the way the signatures uh, transmitted, rather it's about the, what you're actually doing. And what I find in this research through laboratory uh, studies is that people um, tend to overclaim uh, compensation. They over report how well uh, they they've done in a, in a task and they also can solve impossible anagrams, which is a way for us to uh, to test whether or not people cheated. So the people that uh, had to actually sign their name with a stylus or with a pen just to, to write out the signature they practiced when they were little, uh, they were uh, more likely to uh, report that, the, how they had actually finished the test as opposed to people who just signed the X or wrote the pin? Yes, exactly. So people who sign via stylus or using a pen uh, will re report a more accurate performance, uh, whereas people who use a variety of different electronic signatures tend to over-report and inflate um, their performance. So do you think this means that these all these e-signatures just having to sign an X makes us less honest? Uh, so... It doesn't make us cheat, all right? Um, it's not that after you provide electronic signature, suddenly you have this, this urge to just go out and cheat. That's not what uh, I'm saying. Oh, what this research is showing is that these electronic signatures are less effective at curbing dishonesty. Uh, so uh, now can you, do you think you could extrapolate this research 
to something like online fraud? I mean, researchers say, uh, we talk, talked a lot about like the chip and pin technology versus right. the uh, chip and sign technology. And they say chip and pin is just much, so much more secure. Uh, but is there, is, do you think your research, uh, you could use your research to say that not having to physically sign a credit card slip um, might make people more likely to use credit cards fraudulently? So it's something that we should start thinking to be thinking about. Um, and this research also shows uh, that when we don't have, when we don't feel or experience that self-presence while we're signing, then we're uh, less likely to engage in honest behavior. Um, and so what we want to do then is we want to design uh, a technology that will allow the signer to exert both um, agency, which is control over how the signature is going to appear, and increase the intimacy that people experience when they're providing us that, that signature. And so if we were to use uh, the chip a technology, we want to somehow, uh, in addition to just ex and just inserting the, the chip credit card, somehow increase the intimacy that people experience during that process as well. So the way a lot of us think about it is like, well, who's ever going to look at this? I'm, you know, the sign you know, whatever, no one's going to compare, uh, you know, you can like use a spouse's credit card, write your name, no one's looking. So what you're saying is it's really not about some other person uh, checking this, some outside person. It's about how we feel when we're signing and whether uh, we mean it, what we're signing. Right, right. And so when when, I, when we're providing those signatures, uh, there are actually two selves, right? So there's us and there's the ideal self um, that's very honest. And so by giving uh, your own personal signature or handwritten signature, we're decreasing the gap between the self that's actually doing something and this ideal self, this perfect self who will never ever cheat. So do you think that you could expand this research to all the rest of the technology that is becoming uh, more, uh, less handwritten, more digital? Are we likely, more likely to tell lies if we're texting or emailing rather than speaking to someone face to face? Well, I don't have any empirical data to back that up, but um, just pure speculation. Uh, it's possible that uh, these technology may make it easier for us to engage in those behaviors. And it may also change the way we perceive those behaviors. For example, um, if you were to ask me to tell a white lie via email um, and tell a white lie uh, in front, right in someone's face, that may feel very different uh, to me. Uh, and perhaps um, by telling a white lie via email, I may not even see that as telling a white lie. I may just think, rationalize that into, well, I was just giving a reason for being late today. Right. So uh, I'm obviously simplifying a lot of this. Um, you have all your research is a lot of research is online. We, we can provide links on our website uh, to that if people want to dig more deeper into um, your methodology. Um, I was looking into some of your other behavioral science research. Um, I saw that you used Amazon's Mechanical Turk online marketplace for jobs for some of your research. Those are the people that are willing to do jobs. And it's, you know, it's kind of a free market of um, just little jobs. Do you regularly find test subjects there? And uh, and also, uh, do you think that's changed the research process at all? Uh, so uh, for me, I use a variety of different participant pool. Uh, Mechanical Turk is one of the pools I use. And it's a great uh, method for researchers to reach in uh, a broad sample base. Um, and it's an improvement over just using uh, college students, for example. Um, but I do believe in triangulating different um, participant samples so that we get to the core issue here. Um, and McKenna has really expedited uh, the, the data collection process. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Eileen Chow, PhD, is an assistant professor of public policy at the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at UVA, University of Virginia. Thanks so much for coming on and doing this research. Thank you so much, Megan. Take care. You too. And finally tonight, we talk a lot about autonomous vehicles on this show. When will the technology be widely available? Will it be ubiquitous or just in cities? Who will be liable for accidents? Lots of questions. But rarely do we look at the story from the driverless cars point of view. Scan Lab, that's a research project that specializes in large-scale 3D scanning, drove a 3D laser scanner through the streets of London to see if it could use, a, could give us an idea of how a robot car might see the world. Uh, let's take a look at that video. So it's an amazing video. Uh, I 
highly recommend if you uh, want to fall asleep or just entertain yourself for a while, meditate. It's really interesting. Um, autonomous cars already have the ability to use scanners to brake, to detect pedestrians, parallel park, change lanes more safely, and a lot more. Now, according to the New York Times, Scan Lab studies how laser scanning equipment can easily be fooled by applying it in inappropriate conditions or by misusing the gear. So it's interesting to take a look at sort of the idea of what a driverless car might be seen. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. We are on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and Apple TV. Thanks to those of you who sent in suggestions last night about alternatives to the frog in the slowly boiling pot of water metaphor for how we don't notice how we're slowly giving away all of our privacy rights. Uh, the metaphor has been proven scientifically inaccurate and also cruel to frogs. Mike Hall suggested death by a thousand cuts and Dana Schwartz offered it's a slippery slope like a frog's back in a pan of water. You can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And of course, watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today. That's every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.